Hello community. How is RAG connected with PEFT? This is what we're going to look at in this video. So I got a lot of questions from you and it is about RAG versus here PEFT lower. So our retrieval augmented generation versus the parameter efficient fine tuning with a low rank adaptation. And your question were about those topics. Can I use RAG to fine tune an LLM? How do I apply it? And is it at first RAG and then LoRa or vice versa? And can I learn my LLM a second language just using RAG? So let's have an answer to all your questions. And you know me, we do a little bit of a challenge. So I want to give you two perspectives of the solutions. And the first is, of course, I'm going to show you here a conversation I had with GPT-4. In GPT-4, I programmed three synthetic agents and I let those three agents explore here exactly your question. So you see here at the bottom here, this HTTPS link. I leave it in the description of this video. You click on this and you get here my complete GPT-4 conversation. You can scroll up and down. You can see how I program here my three agent within GPT-4. And you can read this. It's about 10 to 15 minutes read. It answers all your questions and you find all the solutions over there. And if you click on continue this conversation, you can add questions given that the system read in now my conversation. Or, and this is the interesting thing, you prefer a human explanation. And you might say, hey, who is going to be this human? And I'm so sorry, it's going to be me. So here we start with RAG. Now, you know what is the basic situation that we start from. We have here an LLM, I have my query, and I want a response from the LLM. Now, if I ask here now the LLM, hey, what happened yesterday in my hometown, Vienna, Austria? Of course, the LLM cannot have this in its learned information. So we go to the internet web pages, we look at about 1,000 pages, we find here 100,000 sentences of information. But you know, as I showed you in my last video, all this information is embedded in a semantic vector space. We perform a cosine similarity search in the vector space. We re-rank the result with a cross encoder and we return the three most relevant information pieces back to our LLM. And here we have it. So we have three sentences that come back from the complete internet search or vector store search or rag based API search, whatever you have, and those three sentences, hey, yesterday in Vienna, a football match between, well, I don't know, or the government decided on something very important, or, hey, it was really rainy with strong winds. So you get now back here three information pieces, three sentences, or so if you have a higher content with more than 4K, for example, you get three paragraphs or three big paragraphs back and they are fed in. And then here now the LLM has three new sentences. If you want rack based information as an info and it writes now an answer. This is rack. Remember all what comes back. We still have our, let's say, 4K context window. Doesn't change at all here rack. Great. What we call it? In the good old days, this is about three months ago, we called it a rack-based API call to a weather station, to some dedicated databases, to I don't know what. Now, today, where we are much more advanced in the marketing terms, we call it a rack retriever. Because here we have now a retriever functionality. So whatever there is, a vector store, internet web pages, your document store, you just retrieve your relevant information. You know this. Some of my viewers said, hey, you said that this is an in-context learning prompt. Is this true? Well, you're right. In-context learning, when you have three sentences as a few example in your prompt, 
It was originally called an in-context learning if it was typed by a human. But if now here you have a dynamically generated answer by a vector store or by an expert system, it should be called here RAG. So if you're really absolutely semantically precise, in-context learning in the original meaning was when a human typed one, two, three example within the prompt that I feed now into my LLM. But if it is dynamically generated by any algorithm, it should be called RAG. This is to be absolutely precise. What is important is that with RAG, any RAG you have, our neural connectome of our LLM, those billions of weight tensors within the LLM that generate here our logical functionality, those tensors did not change at all. The system did not learn anything if you switch off the system. This is it. You see, rack is just to bring in three sentences, ten sentences for here the inference, and this is it. And now you understand why they are working here hard to give here rack here some memory. So we have then here a, how to call it, a memory LLM for rack optimization. I give you an example. Imagine that our LLM has been pre-trained on the English language. And now my query I ask now here, my LLM was, I give you three English words and please translate those three English words to its French counterpart. So what Rack did, Rack went out to the internet, said, hey, I have here three English words, what are the French words? And it came back with the three French words. And then the LLM generated a response and you might think, hey, my LLM is now able to speak French. No. It was just using the RAG returned data on just three French words and integrated this in a beautiful response generated by our LLM. But the LLM has not learned anything at all. This was the end of RAG. Wait a second, you might say. There were questions about, hey, what about Llama index? You just say, I built without Llama index. Why? Now, 15 hours ago, recording this video, we have here by Jerry Leo, he is the CEO of the Llama Index here, he says, hey, there's been a lot of great embedding advancement in the past week. And there has now a Cohere version 3 embedding, top of the list of retrieval performance optimized for a rack. It is beautiful. And then look what he says. So today, no, yesterday. Yesterday he said, hey, if you are building a rack, you should consider fine-tuning your embeddings. Now, this is interesting because now we learn that the embeddings are not optimal for each and every job and for each and every person. So if you want to get a better performance, now you have it here officially, if you're using Rack, fine-tune your embeddings to get a better performance. Now you might say, hey, we know this because in your last video here, this was the thumbnail of my last video, I had shown you here this information as the starter where I told you our Llama 2 model, our sources of the data in the internet and our rack. And I told you, when we code this and I give you a complete code tutorial, we use here our sentence transformer for the embedding here of the semantic content and then for the re-ranking of the returned cosine similarity results, we use here from Esport a cross encoder. This is a B encoder, this is a cross encoder for further optimization and a better re-ranking which three sentences will be fed back into our LLM. And as I told you, I would recommend I use here my personal expert system that I have optimized on my domain. My domain is science, mathematics, physics, whatever. And you might say, hey, why is it that now everybody is recommending Cohere embeddings? Well, it is what a coincidence that the brain of sentence transformers of Esper, the creator, Niels Reimers, is now at Cohere. 
So the one who invented here our B encoder, the cross encoder, and everything. Now you understand why you have now the official enforcement by Llama Index. Hey, use now the best embeddings from Cohere. What a coincidence! But it is also if you go to, you know where, you have also the official Llama Index account, and they said yesterday, hey, a big failure mode of Rack is the retrieval quality, because the retrieved context from databases, vector store, internet pages, might be thematically, semantically irrelevant. Or it matches keywords, but it has zero information for my query. And now they say, hey, even here, this account, hey, Cohere new embed model ranks the documents not just on the topic, but also on the content quality given my query. Therefore, it is now optimized for Rack. And you might say, hey, what a coincidence, because I did a video on this two weeks ago where I explained here to improve the quality of Rack with a self-reflective Rack. Self-Rack is the solution. And now, yesterday, also the official Lama Index said, hey, this is the way to go. And if you want to go even one step further, have a look at Self-Rack. In general, if you're interested in this topic, six months ago I published this video how to upgrade your vector database to an AI. If you want to go beyond vector databases, and here about two or three weeks ago, I had this video where I showed you that autogen here, why with the autogen rack fails. And I have given you a theoretical physics quantum analogon to explain you why we have a decoherence in the operating vector spaces. So if you want to have a theoretical deep dive, here you find the explanation why Lama Index now says, hey, optimize your embeddings for your specific domain that you have to query. But now this is the real end of Rack. Look at this. Yes, I can do animations. I'm so proud here. What we have now, we have now that all the content of the internet pages are not just sending back three sentences, but the complete pages with 100,000 sentences extracted from the internet, no, borrowed from the internet, <coughs> is now read in to my LLM. And we have here the process of fine tuning. And you notice, and all the billions and billions of weight tensors in my LLM are now modified, are now trained, are now learning to adapt to the new given data sets. And I'll give you an example here. LLM has been pre-trained on the English language like before. Now, if I completely fine tune the classical fine tune the LLM on all the French internet pages that there are. The LLM has now learned a second language. So you see, this is a methodology to bring in the complete knowledge, but also have the insight into this knowledge. You do not just import data, but you get here the, the background, the insight, the interconnect that those data represent. So now the system has learned a second language. There are some problems because this is very expensive. I always tell you if you want to find if you want to pre-train a model, it is about one million dollar. If you want to fine-tune it is, it's about ten thousand to a hundred thousand dollars, depending on your data and your model. It is very time consuming and it is great for extracting here the complex insight for a specific downstream task. So this is a opt further optimization you fine tune for a downstream task, a very specific singular downstream task, and then this thing can do it. This was the end of fine tuning. Now, now it gets interesting. So we know now that our LLM has been pre-trained on everything about physics. Then it was fine-tuned on a specific branch on mathematical astrophysics. 
So here we read now in all, I don't know, 10,000 archive preprints of the last five years. Now we have a base of physics. We have fine-tuned on a very specific topic, mathematical astrophysics. And now comes PAFT with LoRa. Now the question is that I say, hey, given this, what is the latest development in theoretical physics since the system has been fine-tuned? Let's say I haven't fine-tuned my system for five months. So read in all the, on the internet, available, I don't know, PDF or archive or LaTeX files or whatever data you have. Let's say, again, read in 100,000 sentences. And now, and this is the beauty, now the question, the latest development in theoretical physics, brings back here a data set, an external data set, and now something happens. We do, you remember, PEFT, parameter efficient fine-tuning. So we do with PEFT here a fine-tuning, so we integrate here the knowledge into our LLM and not just the extracted data the numerical data, but we integrate the complete knowledge behind those publications and the theoretical interlink, the neural connectome, the semantic network of all those documentation. And you see, this is a specific methodology of PEFT. We have chosen here one of the methodology and we go with a low rank adaptation of our tensor structure. But you see, Physics, then mathematical astrophysics, and then we go for an even smaller subset, just the last five months, what is the, really the latest paper in theoretical physics. And now we bring this knowledge inside the LLM. So, fine-tuning for LLM. The beauty is that it reduces the computational and the memory requirements for our GPU node because we use adapter weights. Those are, in our case, represented by low rank adaptation, tensor structure, matrix structures, and they offer a parameter efficient method to adapt the pre-trained and fine-tuned models to a new task or the latest development in theoretical physics. So we introduce a small number of trainable parameters. Those are tensors, of course, that modify the behavior of the self-attention mechanism in the transformers. And now I noticed that there is maybe a problem in understanding how this works. So, I try very easy visualization. This is our LLM and it has billions of weight tensors in, our, in its neural network structure that is now trained. And a lot of people think that the PEFT LoRa, this additional injected adapt tuning, is now happening in addition, but outside here. That there is no real connect between those two. And this is wrong. This is the wrong picture. Because this is the way it is. We are inside our LLM and we just now inject or add tensors, adapter tuning. And these tensors I have here, four little tensors in our simplified visualization of the weight. So you see, with PEFTLAR, we have about, let's say, 1% of the existing tensors we add now. And we add for the particular task of further partial fine-tuning the LLM on a second, on a further task. Great. So with parameter efficient tuning, only the adapter weights in pink are trained on the new data. Let me give you another kind of perspective on this. Imagine this here is our two-dimensional visualization of all the weight tensors. So let's put this in a three-dimensional. So here, the screen here is identical here, the screen here in three dimension. And this tensors, all those hundred and billions and tensors, we now freeze. We make it 
unchangeable. So th those have values, but those values are frozen. And here we have the billions of weight tensors, frozen, but with a value. And then we have a second plane, if you want, where we inject now our path adapter weights, our, for example, LoRa adaptations. So we add here another plane where we have here our one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four tensors. And we add those tensors, but we make them learnable. Those weight tensors can be modified when the fine tuning happens. And as I told you, hey, if you think this is about 100% of all the tensors, it is about 1 to 3% of the tensors. So this is a fraction of tensors we add to the complexity of the system. And then you do the parameter efficient fine tuning. Now, I got question, hey, if those are frozen, they are not there anymore. Why do I care about them? This is not the case. They are frozen, but their values are there. And each value is integrated in the learning process. It is only that the frozen tensors are not modified in their numerical value. Only those weights here in the second pink plane are modified. Only those tensors adopt here to the new task. So, in an example, this blue LLM learned the English language. So, the neural conic dome in this plane is not altered. No tensor structure is modified. However, if the additional task is now, you know English, but now we learn the medical English. Maybe the Latin terms for each of your muscles, or I don't know, whatever there is in medical terms, domain-specific semantic terms to learn. This is now what we need. So we need to have the ability that our system speaks English, and then we just, on top, we learn here medical English. And in this job here, only the additional neural net conic term of this plane is altered, so only those tensors are learning. And this works surprisingly very, very performant. So now you understand. Also, the neural conic term here, the weight tensors are frozen. It is important that they are there because they are integrated in the learning process, but only the weights of our second plane are altered. Great. This has an advantage the preservation of pre-trained knowledge. As I told you here, this blue plane here, this is the knowledge how to speak English. The syntax, the semantic, the grammar, everything. And by keeping these neurons unchanged, we do not modify this ability at all. We just add something here in addition. So this path Laura ensures that the rich knowledge captured during the pre-training, our blue plane, is preserved. And another beneficial effect is that for transfer learning, it prevents catastrophic forgetting. What is this? If you would just continue to fine-tune and then fine-tune and fine-tune here in the classical fine-tuning, if you stack here four, five, six, eight fine-tuning processes on top of each other, Everything is always altered. And of course, given the last training run on the eight fine-tuning step, the first fine-tuning step here, the neural conic dome, those values are almost forgotten because it has been trained on seven other fine-tuned tasks. But if I do not fine-tune, but I use here a path fine-tuning, I only inject a very small amount of tensors in a plane, and only those tensors in this plane are learning the new job. So you see, we can prevent catastrophic forgetting, and this is the beauty of PEFT, for example, PEFT LoRa. Great. Summary. Hey, what is PEFT? Making an LLM more adaptable or specialized here with our pink plane that we add, a tensor plane. 
through a parameter efficient fine tuning with a very specialized, of course, we need a data set for the fine tuning. What is RAG? RAG is a dynamically augmenting the LLM's generative capabilities of generating an answer, a textual answer, with some external information. We get three sentences back from the database. So you see, there's a significant difference between those two modes of operation. And you know me, I have an addendum. So our LLM was pre-trained and then fine-tuned. Great. And then, as I just showed you, we have now for the latest developments, we have pathed LoRa. So you see the, the way we do this pre-training, fine-tuning, parameter-efficient fine-tuning. And then, at the end, we have RAG. We have our RAG retriever. And to stay in this example of physics, mathematical astrophysics, and the latest now, what is the typical topic we have with the RAG retriever? And it is, hey, I've heard yesterday there was a new publication with a new numerical value on the latest neutrino mass threshold. And then I get one single numerical value back from my RAG retriever after it searched here specific databases or publication databases or whatsoever. So you see with RAG, in this example, I build upon the pre-trained model fine-tuning, the parameter-efficient fine-tuning, and then RAG only delivers me here a single numerical value. So if you want to see this now in a different perspective, let's have a look at this. This is the complexity, the amount of training, the intensity of the system here. Pre-training is so important. Pre-training learns the model to speak the English language, for example, or to do mathematics, or to do coding, or whatever. This is the importance of pre-training, given that this here is 100%. This is the importance of pre-training. Then we have fine-tuning for specific tasks, like mathematical astrophysics. Then we have here path lower for very specific task, our pink plane that we now train here, a very specialized and expert system. And then, and only then, we have RAG. And the way RAG is there is just here, let's say, for the last 1% of actual real-time information to integrate in the whole, let's say, body of knowledge, a body of reasoning, body of understanding of our LLM. But of course, if you read current streaming data or literature or whatever, whatever platform you go, you think, hey, RAG is so important. You know, everybody's talking about RAG. This is here the marketing hype of RAG. But if you know how to code it and you get it, understand the system, you understand where the place of RAG is to the current marketing hype that RAG encounters here in our current literature. All components are important, but this here shows you the impact of the importance. If you want to find one, if you want to optimize something, it shows you what is the effect if you go to pre-training or to optimize RAG. Wait. What is here an example of RAG? If I want to know the temperature in my hometown of Vienna at 2.35 p.m. today, I know it was 12 degrees Celsius. And the, let's call them the RAG people. Say, hey, if this is wrong, if this answer would give me 11.8 degree, the whole LLM is wrong. I cannot use the whole LLM because one answer here was not the right numerical value. Well, surprise, this is not the way you use an LLM. This I can Google. This is not the main topic of an LLM. The main topic of an LLM is to get insights to create a neural connectome, a semantic connectome 
on the pre-training data, on the fine-tuning data, so that it, yeah, it does not understand this. You know that an AI does not understand, but it simulates similar sort processes or procedures that it is executing to come to similar conclusion, what we as humans call reasoning. So, you see, there are two viewpoints. One says, hey, my LLM has to give me the absolute latest information just one second ago. This is not what is an LLM is all about. I use an LLM to get deeper insight into some complex topics. But if I want to see the temperature, I just Google it. <laughs> as long as Google, Google it exists, because also they are AI. But you know, this is the main point I also wanted to tell you. Take a step back, make yourself familiar with the real outline of the complex topic, and then you know exactly where you focus your attention on. Talking about attention, if you want to have a deep dive into any of those topics I just mentioned, this is the video if you want to have Path Lore explained in details in 40 minutes. It's beautiful. Or if you want to see the code, how we use Path and Lore on a 4-bit quantization with a transformer reinforcement learning and we use here the supervised fine-tuning code from Hugging Face. This is the coding video for you. If you want to go here with an 8-bit path in PyTorch 2, this is the video for you. Or I have a whole playlist for adaptive tuning with path and lore for new LLMs. And there are now new quantization methodologies. You might know quantized LoRa. Now we have loft quantization. So if you want to have a deep dive further into the topic, this is what I would recommend. Great. I think this is it for today. I really enjoyed this video. It was great to prepare it. I hope it was a little bit informative for you. I try to answer all your questions and it would be great to see you in my next video.